Hello, Kerrigan Skelly with Refuting Calvinism YouTube channel. Uh, back with you today. And today I want to give you a video that isn't of me refuting Calvinism, but <clears throat> just gives you a bunch of quotes from John Calvin himself. Because throughout my time, my interaction with Calvinists, uh, whether it be in the beginning or up until this point in time, I'm constantly getting Calvinists who tell me that I'm strawmanning their position or that I don't understand Calvinism. And what I find in these disputes, these contentions with me about what I'm refuting and what I'm coming against, is that oftentimes these Calvinists don't agree with themselves. And so what I want to give you is the Calvinism that I am refuting, that I am rejecting, and I am coming against. And... I have many sources for the Calvinism I'm coming against, and one of them is John Calvin himself. Now, I know, I know, you, you Calvinists are going to say it's not about John Calvin, it's about, you know, the Bible and what the Bible says, and I agree it's about what the Bible says. The problem is I don't think it says what you think it says. And since the, really, the beginning of Calvinism in the form of TULIP, even though Calvin didn't make up the acronym, I understand that, and he didn't come up with the, the word, you know, the acronym for his, his teachings, the tulip does describe what he taught and what he believed. And Calvinism is named after him, even though I would contend that Augustine was the beginner of most of what is Calvinism when it comes to soteriology. Um, but Calvin is one of the sources I have for what I'm coming against in Calvinism, as well as many other teachers throughout the years, including modern-day ones, and as well as my interactions with professing Calvinists. And so... Um, my uh, my position is that these people who are saying I'm strawmanning Calvinism or that um, I'm misrepresenting Calvinism, they don't know what Calvinism is themselves. That's my contention. That's what I would say, is that most of them don't know what Calvinism is. Um, they'll do a cursory glance of the scriptures. They'll see words like predestined and so on and so forth, and they'll say, well, there's... They'll put the Calvinist understanding to some degree on that, but they'll watch people like maybe Paul Washer or Tim Conway, or, or maybe they'll watch John MacArthur, or maybe they'll read Charles Spurgeon. And these people who I just named, for the most part, are inconsistent Calvinists when it comes to soteriology. And so um, I'm coming against consistent Calvinism, the Calvinism of Calvin himself and many other theologians, and I hope to make this a new series from the horse's mouth. Uh, and so this is from the horse's mouth, John Calvin. So I'm just going to read to you a bunch of quotes, all of them except for one, are from John Calvin's Institute of Christian Religion. And um, I'm going to give the references too, so you can look it up and check to see if I'm quoting him in context or if I'm, if I'm doing it rightly or not, which I contend that I am. So let's go ahead and get to the quotes and see what he has to say. But those who, while they profess to be the disciples of Christ, still seek for free will in man notwithstanding of his being lost and drowned in spiritual destruction, labor under a manifold delusion, making a heterogeneous mixture of inspired doctrine and philosophical opinions, and so erring as to both. Creatures are so governed by the secret counsel of God that nothing happens but what he has knowingly and willingly decreed. We hold that God is the disposer and ruler of all things. That from the remotest eternity, according to his own wisdom, he decreed what he was to do, and now by his power executes what he decreed. Hence we maintain that by his providence, not heaven and earth, and inanimate creatures only, but also the counsels and wills of men, are so governed as to move exactly in the course which he has de destined. Thieves and Murderers and other evildoers are instruments of divine providence being employed by the Lord himself to execute judgments which he has resolved to inflict. The devil and the whole train of the ungodly are in all directions held in by the hand of God as with a bridle. So they can neither conceive any mischief nor plan what they have conceived, nor how much soever they may have planned move a single finger to perpetrate, unless and so far as he permits, nay, unless and so far as he commands, 
that are not only bound by his fetters, but are even forced to do him service. How few are there who, when they hear free will attributed to man, then I immediately imagine that he is the master of his mind and will in such a sense that he can of himself incline himself either to good or evil. It may be said that such dangers are removed by carefully expounding the meaning to the people. But such is the proneness of the human mind to go astray. It will more quickly draw error from one little word than truth from a lengthened discourse. Of this, the very term in question, free will, furnishes too strong a proof. I think the abolition of it would be a great advantage to the church. I am, willing to, I am unwilling to use it myself, and others that take my advice will do well to abstain from it. We call predestination God's eternal decree, by which he compacted with himself what he willed to become of each man. For all are not created in equal condition. Rather, eternal life is foreordained for some, eternal damnation for others. We say that God once established by his eternal and unchangeable plan those whom he long before determined once for all to receive into salvation and those whom, on the other hand, he would devote to destruction. He has barred the door of life to those whom he has given over to damnation. We cannot assign any reason for his bestowing mercy on his people, but just as it is so pleases him, neither can we have any reason for his reprobating others but his will. Therefore those whom God passes over he condemns, and this he does for no other reason than that he wills to exclude them from the inheritance which he predestines for his own children. Many professing a desire to defend the deity from an individual charge admit the doctrine of election, but deny that anyone is reprobated. This they do ignorantly and childishly, since there could be no election without its opposite, reprobation. It is utterly, in, in, is utterly inconsistent to transfer the preparation for destruction to anything but God's secret plan. God's secret plan is the cause of hardening. I admit that in this miserable condition wherein men are now bound, all of Adam's children have fallen by God's will. With Augustine, I say, the Lord has created those whom he unquestionably foreknew would go to destruction. This has happened because he has willed. Individuals are born who are doomed from the womb to certain death and are to glorify him by their destruction. It is vain to debate about prescience, which is foreknowledge, which it is clear that all events take place by his sovereign appointment. But since he foresees future events only by reason of the fact that he, de he decreed that they take place, they vainly raise a quarrel over foreknowledge, when it is clear that all things take place rather by his determination and bidding. Again I ask, whence does it, does it happen that Adam's fall irremediably involved so many peoples together with their infant offspring in eternal death and lust because it so pleased God? The decree is dreadful indeed, I confess. Yet no one can deny that God foreknew what end man was to have before he created him, and consequently foreknew, because he so ordained by his decree. And it ought not to seem absurd for me to say that God not only foresaw the fall of the first man, and in him the ruin of his descendants, but also meted it out in accordance with his own decision. The first man fell because the Lord deemed it meet that he should. If God foresaw what he was unwilling should happen, that he is not supreme. Therefore he determined whatever should be, because independently of his will, nothing could be. So there you go. That's uh, just some of the quotes, and I have a lot more I could have shared, but I wanted to make the video uh, somewhat short. And uh, hopefully you can see uh, what I'm coming against. Now, if you don't agree with Calvin, then I would say you're not a Calvinist. Um, and so maybe you should call yourself something else. But if you want to just discuss the scriptures, that's fine. I have no problem with that. My channel is full of videos discussing the scriptures that Calvinists use to support their doctrines. Uh, but this is one of the sources I have, going to the horse's mouth here, so to speak, for coming against Calvinism. These are some of the doctrines that I'm coming against. So hopefully uh, if you are a Cal if you call yourself a Calvinist and you don't agree with this stuff, 
hopefully you'll see uh, how wicked John Calvin's doctrines were and how unbiblical they were. Uh, and if you are someone who's not a Calvinist, and you weren't sure about Calvinism, if you check it out and you hear a lot of Calvinist teachers, uh, this you can see for yourself the source of Calvinism, where it began as a whole. All of Tulip began with, with Calvin, even though some of it could go trace back to uh, Augustine. So hopefully you enjoyed this video, and uh, hopefully you learned something from it, and uh, the Lord bless you.